everybody, this is Joel Kennedy with Kennedy Violins. Should you buy a new instrument? Well, maybe. Let's talk about it. So should you buy another instrument or not? Well, it's kind of an age old question, but it's a question worth putting a lot of uh, consideration into because string instruments are so expensive. I mean, the sky's the limit, right? So I'd say there's probably five primary reasons why you would want to consider getting another instrument. So the first one would be size. Uh, the, sec the second one would be you want improved setup. Uh, the third one would be you want improved sound. The fourth one would be you want improved uh, playability. And the fifth would be your instrument is damaged and you want to know if you should replace it or not. So let's talk about those uh, five things uh, kind of in order. And I'll try to be as uh, concise and brief as I possibly can, but there's a lot you can say on each particular subject. Okay, so the first one would be size. Now, if you're an adult, more than likely, I mean, 99% of the chance, you know, you need a full-size instrument, whatever it is, you know? Um, and the reason that you want a full-size instrument or you want a larger instrument is because a larger instrument will always sound better. It's gonna produce a bigger sound. It's probably gonna produce a superior sound. A lot of times you can even have an inferior instrument and just be because it's bigger, it's going to sound better. So there's definitely a lot of advantages. Now, even if you're an adult and you're, you know, you're small, more than likely you could still play on a full size. Most kids 11 years old and older can play on a full size. In fact, a lot of 10 year olds can play on a full size instrument, especially, you know, violin. So more than likely, now if it's more difficult for you, yeah, that's, it's, it's more difficult. It will take an acclimation period. It takes about a month to acclimate. Now let's say the fourth finger is difficult for you to play in first position on the violin if, and you're an adult. You're like, well, it's, it's too big. Well, probably not. Uh, more than likely, you just your technique is not correct. You're not uh, preparing your hand well. There's something about your setup that's not correct. And you just have to be patient. You know, if your body has to stretch a little bit more, you have to play with a little bit different, different technique or you know, correct technique, it could take you a month of practicing your scales. But like I say, I've taught a lot of uh, adults that were students as well. More than likely, 99% of the chance, there's no problem at all with playing a full-size instrument. Now, if we're uh, talking about kids, now there's sizing charts all over the internet. I'm sure there's a sizing chart on Kennedy Violins as well. I'm not gonna go into sizing in this video because it's a pretty you know in-depth topic, but every teacher is gonna have a different methodology and a different opinion about what size that your kids should be playing. So you can just ask your teacher or just, you know, use your good sense, you know, using a sizing or age chart, you know, that you find on the internet, but it's not a perfect science. No matter what tells you, anybody tells you, everybody's got their own opinion and it's pretty subjective. So if I looked at your kid, I might tell you something different than if another teacher did. The second reason you might consider purchasing another instrument would be setup, okay? So let's say you bought an inexpensive instrument and you're convinced, but the setup is probably pretty bad. You know, just based off of the videos you've seen or how difficult it is to play com compared to some of your friends' instruments or whatever. So what do I mean by setup? Okay, so setup means, you know, how some things were done after the violin, you know, the, or the instrument was basically made. So we're talking about the, the, the nuts, right? So the, 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 the depth of the notches in the nut, how wide they are, how, how tall is the nut, how low is the nut, how is the fingerboard planed? You know, um, the shape of the fingerboard, the shape of the bridge, the thickness of the bridge, how well the bridge contacts the top of your instrument, all these little setup things um, if you bought an inexpensive instrument in particular, let's say you spent, I don't know, less than $400 on an instrument, you know, there's a, and you bought it off the internet, there's a pretty good chance the setup wasn't done right. That's one of the things that, you know, Kennedy Violins, you know, we specialize in doing a proper setup even on an inexpensive instrument, but it's very easy to buy an instrument, especially online, that has a very poor setup. So you can, t if it's a decent instrument, you can take it into a shop and you can have the, prop the setup done properly. However, it could cost you hundreds of dollars. So if you spent, I don't know, three, four hundred dollars or less on an instrument, is it really worth it to you to spend a couple hundred dollars to have the violin set up properly? Well, maybe not. Only you can make that determination. Um, but that is definitely, especially if you bought an inexpensive instrument, that is a, a main criteria for deciding to purchase a more expensive instrument that probably, or at least hopefully, has a lot better setup. Okay, so the third reason is you want better sound, okay? So having a better instrument will have better sound. But the thing is, is that how do you know if 
the sound that you're creating is bad because of you or your instrument. Well, it's probably a combination of both, um, but the thing is, is that if your ability is starting to exceed the ability of your instrument by quite a lot, then you know you have to start seriously considering buying another instrument. The easy way to figure this out is just you know play on a friend's instrument, right? Anybody that you know, just ask them how much did you play for your instrument. If they you know let's say you bought your violin for three hundred bucks and they spent six hundred dollars, all right, and you you pay them you play on theirs and their sound way better even though you're not even used to the instrument. Well, obviously. Um, then you've grown out of your instrument. You could also go to a violin shop and just you know pick a violin that's a little bit above the price point that you paid for your instrument. If if you immediately sound better, then obviously this is evidence again that yeah the sound you've grown out of your instrument. Your ability exceeds the ability of your instrument. It's time to start looking at you know another you know instrument. So why would you want an instrument that sounds better? Well, obviously you're you're going to work less hard to produce a good sound. Now just because your violin isn't natural naturally a great sounding instrument doesn't mean that somebody can't get a great sound out of it because a great player can make just about any instrument sound good. Um, but the thing is, if you're not a professional or really advanced player, it's going to be harder for you to produce a good sound. So you're going to be more dependent on the quality of your instrument. Now, one thing that I'll mention though is that if you're not an advanced player or you're not a professional, you have to take into account that when you try another instrument for whatever reason, you, there's an acclimation period of time. So if you're a professional, like I said, you can make just about any instrument sound good and you can immediately acclimate to whatever characteristics of that instrument are not so great. But if you have less ability, it's going to be a lot harder for you to acclimate to the characteristics of that particular instrument. Plus, you know, you're, you're going to be biased. You know, you've, perhaps you've, your $500 violin, you've been playing on it for four or five years. You're used to that instrument. That's your baby. You know everything about that instrument. But just because you are familiar with that instrument doesn't mean that it's better. So whatever instrument you're trying, make sure you buy it from a place that has a really good return policy, whether it's online or it's a, your local shop. Make sure that they're going to let you take that home for at least a few weeks and get six, eight hours in or whatever playing time so you can and then return it it without any punitive measures <laughs> make sure you can return it you know or try out another instrument you don't want to buy from some place that doesn't have an excellent return policy or a place that says oh once you take it home you own it you know you don't you don't want that so you gotta you if you're a person who has you know less than advanced ability you want to make sure you give yourself the proper time to get used to the instrument because every instrument is completely different. Okay, so the next criteria would be the playability of an instrument. So playability is just a general term for how easy is it for the violin to, to be played. And right? when I say violin, I mean all instruments in string family, violin, viola, cello, bass, right? How hard is it to achieve the kind of sound that you want? Now, this is determined by two primary ways, right? Number one would be this, the, with the setup, which I already mentioned before. Chances are, if you pay more for an instrument, the setup is going to be better. So that means that the nut and the fingerboard and the bridge, you know, the setup is going to be better the more you pay on, play on an instrument. In particular, is, you know, if you spend more than you know, $800, the setup will probably be done professionally, which means the instrument will already just be easier to play. You know, it'll be easier for you to produce the kind of sound that you want. The other part of playability is the inherent characteristics of the instrument. So if it's if you're if you're getting a better quality instrument, it's been carved better, it's got higher quality wood, then it's just going to be easier to play. Maybe the sound is going to be bigger. Um, so if the sound is bigger, it's going to be easier to produce the amount of sound that you want. Um, whether it be, you know, that's especially important if you're in an orchestral situation or a chamber group situation, or if you're just playing with anybody else. You know the the amount of sound that you can create or not, you know, is is um, highly dependent on the amount of sound that your your instrument produces. So in general, you want to get an instrument that's got a big sound because if it's got a big sound, that means it was made properly. The other thing is the response or the um, the responsiveness of the instrument, which is uh, has to do with how the instrument resonates. So if an instrument resonates really easily, that means it's going to be easier to play because it's more responsive. It's going to speak 
faster. You know, as soon as that bow strikes the string, the instrument's gonna speak sooner. It's gonna be easier to get a clear sound. So all of these things put together, they all equal playability. And having an instrument that's made properly, it's made with better materials, it's set up properly, it's just gonna make the instrument a lot easier to play so you won't have to work as hard. And it's gonna increase the, the level at which you can play in the future as your ability improves as you practice. Okay, so the last thing would be if your instrument is damaged. So this one is pretty easy. You go to a shop, you find out how much it costs to repair your instrument. If it exceeds or is very close to what you think your instrument is worth, well, then you don't get it repaired, you buy another instrument. As a general rule, if your instrument is let's say 30 plus years old and it's American or European, the probability that it's worth being repaired goes up quite a bit. Conversely, if you have an instrument that's fairly new, that is uh, maybe has a retail value of less than $800, then the probability goes up very high of it not being worth to, you know, to repair it. So let's say you've dropped it or it's got a crack or let's say if it's developed a crack on the scroll where the peg is or let's say the, the projection is off. Let's say the fingerboard is way too low and the neck has to be reset with some wedges, either wedges here or wedges in here in the block or it's got a, needs a new block inside because it was damaged or the instrument shrunk over the years. You know, these kinds of repairs can cost, you know, 500, 600, 700, 1000 dollars. So it's very easy for the prices to go up, if especially, especially if you go to a reputable, you know, violin shop and it, it won't be worth it to have it repaired. Or you can have it kind of half repaired so it's at least playable and you can use the instrument as a backup, you know. Okay, so the last thing that I'll mention would be a, a big don't. You don't want to purchase a violin solely based off of the brand or the price point. So I'll just talk about brand really quick. You know, string instruments aren't like band instruments. Now, all band, band instruments are going to have their unique personality and, and playability characteristics, but the margin is pretty small. So what I mean by that is, let's say you want to you want to have the same instrument as the principal of the, you know, the New York Philharmonic. You know, let's say you want to have the same uh, horn, right? You know, you can go down to the, sh the, the, the local band shop and probably buy the same horn. Now, it's not the exact same horn. It's not going to sound exactly like that person's horn, but you could probably buy the same make and model. You know, um, you could probably buy a, a trumpet. You could buy a Monet trumpet. Let's say the principal of New York Philharmonic or something plays a Monet trumpet. Well, you can go, if you have the money, you can go buy that same brand of Monet trumpet. Now, is it going to sound exactly the same? No. Um, but, you know, it's going to be pretty darn close. But my point is that you can't really do that with uh, instruments to some extent. You can't go out and buy probably the same exact instrument that the concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic has or whatever. And the differences of string instruments from one to another is, is great. There's, there's a lot of differences just because the inherent characteristics of a stringed instrument, they're made out of a living substance. You know, that's different depending on when it was cut, where it was cut, the, the species, the time of year, how it was cut. I mean, there's just so many characteristics and so the differences could, can be really great. So you really don't want to buy uh, on brand. If anything, especially in the, in, well, if anything, you want to purchase from a reputable dealer. So uh, you want to buy from a company that you trust, that has a good reputation. So at least you know that you're probably buying an instrument that is going to be a good value for the money. They're going to stand behind, you know, what they're selling you. And so that's the, a good place to start. Make sure you're buying from a reputable company. That's, that's going to be probably the best foundation as far as buying a string instrument. Now, as far as uh, buying based off a of price point, you, you can do that to an extent with the lower echelon instruments, but definitely not in the higher echelon instruments. So if you're buying, um, if, okay, if you go to a violin shop and let's say your budget is, I don't know, $1,800, okay? So you don't want to, you don't want to go in there and then assume that the $1,800 $1 violin is going to be, you know, twice as good as the $800 violin because there's a good possibility it's not twice as good. It might be 10% better. Or an, another, a better example would be a $1,800 violin versus a $3,000 violin. Is that $3,000 violin, you know, significantly better than $1,800 violin? It could be, 
but yeah, you know, there's a possibility it might be only be 5% better. There's a possibility the $1,800 one could be better than the $3,000 one. So you really don't wanna buy based off a of price. Now in the lower echelon, it can make more sense to buy based off a of price to an extent. Um, a $200 violin will pretty much almost never be as good as a $500 violin, or a $150 violin is probably firewood compared to a $350 violin, more than likely. But once you get past the $1,200 point, then, you know, then it really is kind of a mixed bag. You just, you, uh, you, you really don't want to buy based on price point. So what I recommend is if you go to a violin store in particular, that you give them a price range. Let's say your budget's $2,000. You say, okay, I want to see all your instruments for $2,000 and less. And, and, then, and then try them out. Maybe bring a friend, bring her teacher, but don't look at the prices. Just play them blind. You'd be surprised. You know, I've, I, whenever I was younger and shopping for instruments, I always shop blind. I would just go into a viola room where there might be 40 or 50 violas and I wouldn't know what any of them cost. And I would just pick my top two. I did that with one of my advanced students one time. Both of us picked the same viola. It was $1,800 Chinese viola. It was the best sounding, easiest playing instrument in the entire room. And there was $90,000 violas in there. So you just, you just never know. And the violin shops, they don't price instruments based off of sound or playability. They just don't. They price them based off of what they paid for them and the margin that they need to make on that instrument. So when I got that viola for $1,800, it sounded better than their $10,000 violas. I felt like I got an awesome deal and I did. It was a diamond in the rough. Now the dealer didn't care because they paid the same for that $1,800 violin as they did the other $1,800 instrument that didn't sound half as good. You know, they didn't test the instruments. They just, they're just all priced the same based off of what they paid for them. So you, you want to have an open mind. You don't want to go in there, you know, buying based off a of price. Just close your eyes. Don't look at the price and just play them for a non-biased opinion. You'd be surprised. And sometimes you'll find a lot of diamonds in the rough. You'll get really lucky. So guys, I hope this uh, video helped. There's a lot more I can say on the subject. You know, if you have any other questions or comments, put them below. I respond to most of the uh, questions or comments that I get. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that alert bell so you get a notification when I create a new video. And you know, all of these videos are up on the Kennedy Violins website on the Joel's Corner. And uh, I've got a lot of videos there, articles, and uh, you can also email me or you can DM me on social media like Instagram or whatever. I respond to most all this stuff. And, you know, don't forget, you know, here at Kennedy Violins, you know, we're all players and teachers. So, you know, we're always happy to answer any kind of questions you guys have anytime. Thanks, guys.